The question that we are going to answer today is relating to requested and suggested reform on UK music law relating to how to make the music streaming markets economically viable for all stakeholders and how this plans for the UK legal framework relation to music streaming compares to what is now in place in most member states of the European Union and how you as a music creator, as a content creator, in particular music creator, you can position yourself to get the best deal. What is the current state of play in relation to these music contracts in the era of the digital single market? Quite a lot of music recording deals and uh, music publishing deals, especially those, of course, with legacy artists, are still very much ruled by the ancient era where CDs were the main distribution channel of music and uh, basically where the sale of physical products was king. With Napster, in the early noughties, this completely changed and Napster, the pirate peer-to-peer -peer music system, just disrupted the whole music economy. Then there was this the time where downloads were in competition with music streaming and then eventually we discovered a few years ago that music streaming won the game for now. The likes of Spotify, Deezer and Apple Music, Amazon Music are now the king of distribution in the music era. All these as I was saying, old recording and publishing contracts in the music industry, in particular for legacy artists, or even for new artists who sign with labels or publishers who still have not updated their templates for the uh, recording deals, well, they end up with a, um, a sore deal, like a difficult situation to deal with in terms of monetizing those music streams. So some figures were released by uh, various bodies recently in, in 2021, such as the International Federation of the Phonographic Industry, IFPI, which explained that the music engagement mix now only relies for 9% on physical products, such as CDs, vinyls, DVDs, downloads, while the streaming services represent at the very least 50%. Uh, between the uh, subscription audio streaming, the ad supported audio streaming, um, and also the video streaming, such as Daily Motion, YouTube, etc. So, streaming definitely has won for now uh, the fight. The problem that CISAC, the International Confederation of Societies of Authors and Composers, has um, underlined in its 2021 Global Collections report is that while streaming is fast heading towards being the most important source of creators' earnings in the future, streaming revenues are not distributed in a way which is fair towards the music creators, so the music composers and the music performers. So what's the solution here? Especially since, as I explained, a lot of music labels and music publishers are still relying on old templates of contracts where it's not clear how music streams are going to be remunerated. There's been this push in the 28 now, but the UK has gone out of the, the EU 27 member states of the European Union since 2016 to set up a single digital market. This uh, single digital market is here to help content creators, but also media and distribution companies find the best way to broadcast the content online while at the same time getting paid for it. The Digital Single Market Directive, which entered into force in 2019, contains a lot of provisions to improve the fluidity, efficiency, and also protection of actual property rights in its content. But today we are only going to focus on the digital single market directive provisions, which are applicable to content creators and music creators, such as music composers and music performers. So the current state of play in relation to those music contracts in the era of the digital single market is that in the EU, the 27 member states have now transposed or are in the process of transposing this DCM, this digital single market directive, the deadline was at the end of uh, June 2021, but I understand that quite a lot of member states did not manage to uh, transpose the directive on time. Anyway, it's underway and they are transposing it now. 
coming back to the state of play, what is happening is that in the UK, creators, content creators are like waking up like, oh my God, the UK is not going to transpose the digital single market directive, obviously, because the UK has done a Brexit. So what's going to happen to us? How can we stay on level playing field with these music creators who are based in the European Union? So in France, in Germany, in Netherlands, Italy, Spain, how can we make sure that we are treated fairly compared to them? That is the current state of play. And this is why, therefore, the UK Parliament, and in particular, the section of the UK Parliament, which is called the House of Commons Digital, Cultural, Media and Sports Committee of the UK Parliament, has come up with a, um, a string of requested changes, recommendations and amendments, in particular, the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988, the CDPA, the, the main law relating to protection of uh, copyright in the UK. The state of play is that some MPs, members of parliament in the UK, have just waken up, they're just trying to ring the bell and give a wake-up call to all the policymakers in the UK that soon, very soon, UK-based musicians and music creators, songwriters, are going to be in a distressed situation because not only can they not go easily touring because of COVID and because of the Brexit issues with obtaining visas, to go and do some live touring in the 27 member states of the EU. So not only do they have these restrictions in relation to live touring, but also they are now going to be at a disadvantage, those UK musicians and music creators, compared to their peers who are based in the EU and who will be able to benefit from the, uh, the level playing field created by the provisions of the Digital Single Market Directive which is being transposed in national law in the 27 member states. That is the state of play. On YouTube, Emily is asking, can UK music creators sign a deal in Europe, in, in uh, the European Union? Good question, Emily. In any case, that will require quite a lot of swagger because if you are signing with a major, like um, a Universal, Warner or Sony, they all have some subsidiaries in various European countries. So say you are a French music creator, that it's very likely that Warner Music France will want to sign you for the recording deal and, and Warner Chapel France will want to sign you for the publishing. And the same goes for Sony in Germany, Universal in Germany, etc. So to answer your question, Emily, how to sign a, a deal in Europe if you are based in the UK, well, this is where you, you need to connect and mingle with fellow artists who are based in the European Union with whom you can do some collaborations and therefore attempt through that way for this sort of collaboration with this other fellow artist based in the European Union to attempt to get a recording deal with, uh, with for example, his or her label in, in France, say. I remember there was this, um, this English artist a few years ago, so that was before the, the transposition of the um, Digital Single Market Directive, who basically got signed by a, a major in France, actually, while he was actually singing in English. So that was quite funny. But it was based in Paris. It was based in France, probably still is, by the way. And he managed to, to sign in France with a major in France and also to uh, do all, all, all his marketing and, and development of his brand as an artist there. I'm trying to, I think his name was Charlie... Charlie's, um, anyway, it will come back to me, but, uh, but that was an interesting case of his, where this guy actually positioned himself as a, an English speaking songwriter and performer to actually launch his career from France. And so therefore, in this instance, if you are signed by a EU label, an EU based label, then you can take advantage of all protections which are inside the, the directive, the Digital Single Market, market Directive. Uh, another also way you can do this is, for example, if you decide to release some music which is uh, going to be uh, liked in uh, EU-based countries. So, for example, if you are Latino or Latina, and therefore you speak Spanish as well as, as English, it is a good idea to really release a, um, a salsa song or a Latinx song because then it will be successful in Spain and then that is attractive to Spanish record labels 
and therefore you can do uh, some business with, uh, for example, so also Latino music is also quite successful in France. So that could really have some attraction, this kind of music, this genre could have some attraction for some uh, EU-based labels in Spain or as I was saying, perhaps even Italy or, or, or France. There are a few questions in the, the chat on Zoom. So what are the disadvantages? I'm not quite sure what that means. So perhaps, Stephen, if you can expand on your question, that would be great. So Amal is asking, could you repeat the name of a copyright policy being discussed in the UK Parliament? Sure. What's happening is that in October 2020, the members of Parliament MPs from the House of Commons Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee launched an investigation during which they heard from music creators, industry experts and streaming services. And they also held some roundtables with musicians to hear their views and wrote to major UK record labels and uh, tech companies for the explanations. So they did an enormous amount of work. Uh, frankly, it was very thorough. I did read the 102 pages report entitled Economics of Music Streaming that they released in July 2021, this committee, and it is a thorough job, really quite thorough and useful. Frankly, I, I found them very constructive. But after this report was issued in July, then the UK government, as well as the, the um, CMA, the UK Competition and Market Authority, issued their response to this committee's report in September 2021. And also in September 2021, there was a bill which was presented by one of the UK MPs, one of the UK members of parliament to the UK parliament. And this is the bill which is called a bill to make provision about the rights and remuneration of musicians, which is dated 24th November 2021. And you can find the link to this bill in my article. As far as the timeline of this bill is concerned, it is now at its second reading stage in front of the House of Commons in the UK. But let's now talk about the protective legal framework set up by the Digital Single Market Directive, which is protective of music creators. Because chronologically, as I explained, first was the Digital Single Market Directive, and then came the UK response to that, to the DSM, to this directive, through the investigation and then the bill that I just mentioned. Thanks, Stephen, for clarifying your point about the disadvantages. So I'll come back to this on, in a second. Okay. Let's delve into what is this protective framework set up by this directive, which, as I said, was entered into force in 2019 with a view of being transposed by June 2021 by the 27 member states. Well, the EU Brussels-based policymakers have done some really, really serious work. And uh, frankly, it is great for music creators. I don't think the labels and the publishers will really like those, those reforms, to be honest. I am actually pretty 300% sure they very much dislike them. But from a uh, creator and content creator perspective, this is really good news. Why? Well... Firstly, because the Digital Single Market Directive introduces some transparency provisions. Its Article 19 provides that offers and performers shall receive on a regular basis, at least once a year, up-to-date, relevant and comprehensive information on the exploitation of their works and performances from the parties to whom they have licensed or transferred their rights or their successes and title, in particular in relation to the modes of exploitation or revenues generated and remuneration due. So now, by law, statutory law, which means that the recording and publishing contracts cannot override these provisions, which are mandatory, now these mandatory provisions force the music publishers and music labels to issue some statements at least once a year to the talent, to performers, writers, lyricists, they need to hand out the uh, information to them and be able to prove it. So they need to keep all the track record of everything, otherwise they could be in trouble. And that is a great way for music creators to like, okay, so my music has been sold that way and the statement shows that I'm owed that much money and I only receive a, a much lower amount of money this year. So what's happening? Where is the money? This transparency provision is also reinforced 
by another directive, which is the one relating to collective management of copyright, which is from 2014, and which also puts an obligation on uh, collective management organizations, so CMOs, collective management organizations, so in France it would be SASEM, ADAMI, in, in the UK it would be PRS, PPL, it would be GEMA in Germany, etc. So the CMOs also have an obligation to provide their rights holders reports of revenues that include the revenue attributed to the rights holder, the amount paid by the CMO to the right holder per category of rights managed and per type of use. Therefore, this transparency obligation is very strong because for a long time it had been put on the CMOs, the uh, collecting societies, but now it is also mandatory for record labels and music publishers. And of course, there's no equivalent of that in the UK for now. This is one of the rights under the Digital Single Market Directive, which is being transposed in 27 member states of the EU. What are some other additional rights that um, this DSM, this D Digital Single Market Directive, has uh, uh, provided to music creators uh, based in the EU? Well, quite a lot, really. And it's all set out in Chapter 3. For example, there is a right to an appropriate and proportionate remuneration. This is called the fair remuneration principle. If you got your statement and your annual statement that your label or your publisher has to send you, you see this and you say, okay, so the publisher has made 1 million out of my songs and in particular my streams. How come I only get 100 euros? What was happening here? And so here, it's very clear that your appropriate and proportionate right to fair remuneration has been breached. And you can say that to your publisher, or you can say that to your label. What, what, what's happening with this? What's, where's my money? So this is why this right of transparency is so useful. So this is Article 18 of the uh, Digital Single Market Directive, this, uh, this right to fair remuneration. There's also in the uh, Article 20 of the Digital Single Market uh, Directive, a contract adjustment mechanism. If armed with information obtained through the transparency obligations, offers and performers see that they have not received a, appropriate and fair remuneration, as I've just explained with my example just earlier, because they can see that the uh, remuneration is disproportionately low compared to the relevant revenues derived from the single exploitation, then women well, can ask for a contract adjustment. They can say, guys, this is not working for me. My streams are not getting paid on them. So I want to have a fair remuneration here. How about you give me 50% of what you make every time you get a stream? You get remuneration from a stream. I want my money. You've got the co contract adjustment mechanism where everybody's got to sit around the table, the council, the lawyer for the performer, the lawyer for the label, and we discuss. We discuss and we say, how are we going to amend this contract so that my client's right to fair remuneration gets respected? You can do a really good negotiation. If it is not successful, then the creators have the option to bring a claim with a voluntary alternative dispute resolution body so an ADR body, and it's not a court, it's an alternative dispute resolution body, which will be set up in the um, EU member state where this music creator is based. So this is like so new. If you are an artist and you've signed your publishing agreement like 20 years ago, a lot of water has gone under the bridge since, and now streaming is so massive, but in your 20 years old contract with your publisher, nothing has been set out about streams, and therefore your publisher pays you as if this uh, stream was a, a license, license income, then you get almost nothing. But through these clauses, which are in the Digital Single Market Directive, now you have a right to force your publisher to sit at the table and renegotiate the contract. As I said, there's also this new alternative dispute resolution mechanism, which has been put in place. This is referred to in Article 21 of the Digital Single Market Directive. And it's great because then you can go to this uh, voluntary body as a music creator, you can say, I have a problem with my um, record label. I have a problem with my publisher. I tried to sit down with them and to renegotiate to get a fair and equitable remuneration, but they would not let me do that with them. And therefore, you as the um, ADR body, you, you need to uh, support me in, in resolving this dispute, which arises because they don't want to renegotiate. But you could also bring 
uh, an ADR dispute to this body in France, in Germany, in, in Spain, etc. If the publisher or the label does not comply with its transparency obligations of providing you at least once a year with a statement. So this is really quite awesome. Even if you are bringing a claim and a dispute in front of this alternative dispute resolution body, you can also still sue in court the publisher of the label. This is such a great change in terms of a balance of power here. The dynamics are completely different. It really is a way to re-empower the music creator. If nobody wants to go into the music business as a music creator, as a content creator, because they know they're not going to be paid a dime on their streams, which are more or less the only way to make money nowadays because nobody can tour anyway. It's not the best and the brightest who are going to join the ranks of the songwriters and the performers of tomorrow. In the supply chain of music, the music creators, be it the lyricists, the uh, composers, or the performers are extremely important. They need to be properly looked after by the other stakeholders in the music industry. And this is really what this digital single market directive is very successfully achieving here. There's also a revocation right. Article 22 of the digital single market directive says that if a copyright work, which has been licensed exclusively, is not being exploited by the licensee, so the record label of a the publisher, then the music creator can terminate the agreement. I suppose also this revocation right could also be used if the renegotiation in order to obtain fair and equitable remuneration fails. So music creators now in the EU have this revocation right. And that's statutory, a statutory right. It cannot be overruled and overridden by the content of any publishing agreement or recording agreement. And indeed, as I was just mentioning, there's a specific ban on contractual overrides of these provisions. Just one point before we move on to uh, what's happening in the UK, on the Digital Single Market Directive, there is another great clause, uh, which uh, is very important for music creators, which is Article 17 of this uh, Digital Single Market Directive, which provides that user-generated content platforms, so the likes of YouTube or Daily Motion, have to enter into licensing agreements with the rights holders regarding the use of protected content uploaded by someone other than the rights holders. If you have Jane Doe, who uploads on her YouTube channel, Jane Doe YouTube channel, the latest music track of Michel Polnareff, who is a French artist, he used to be a, a very big star in France in the 80s. Jane Doe is just an individual. She's not a company. It doesn't uh, clear the rights with Michel Polnareff, uh, publisher and uh, record label when she uploads this track on uh, YouTube. YouTube, as this user-generated content platform, has the obligation now to reach out to the publisher and label of Michel Polnareff, this French songwriter performer, to obtain a license. That means bye-bye safe hyper protection. There's no safe harbor protection now for user-generated content platforms anymore, like uh, YouTube or Dailymotion. They have, by the DSM directive, to obtain those licenses. If it is not possible to enter into a licensing agreement with the rights holder, platforms and rights holder must cooperate in order to ensure that the unauthorized protected works are not available on these user-generated content platforms. So that means if YouTube cannot get a license from the record label and publisher of Michel Polnareff, then YouTube has to remove that track from Jen Doe's YouTube channel. So I cannot tell you how this is creating a shitstorm in the tech industry, because now if the onus is on all these uh, platforms, YouTube and uh, Dailymotion and the likes, to police their uh, content and do obvious enforcement work. So they have to use AI, artificial intelligence, to screen and scan all their uh, clients' various YouTube channels. Again, an enormous shift in the power dynamics here. They can't be like this and hold their arms in, in the air and say, ah, I didn't know, I wasn't aware, and safe harbor, safe harbor, no longer, that's done. 
Otherwise, they will be sued. These UGC platforms will be sued if they don't uh, comply with Article 17. What's happening at the moment, and in France in particular, because France has been the first EU member state to transpose in French national law the content of the Digital Single Market Directive. So what's happening in France in particular is that they're basically suing. They're suing the likes of Google, they're suing the, the likes of the platforms, YouTube, etc. They're giving them massive fines for infringing the uh, national law relating to the transposition of Article 17 of a Digital Single Market Directive, the fines are really, really heavy. I think you've got now a good view of how to use this uh, protective legal framework set up by the Digital Single Market. Let's go back to Stephen's question about the disadvantages of UK performers versus EU performers. Well, now that I've explained what the Digital Single Market Directive contains, Stephen, I think you would agree with me that it's quite clear that UK music creators are very much at a disadvantage because with the Brexit, the Digital Single Market Directive has not been transposed in uh, UK law. And therefore, UK music creators can't use protective tools such as requesting the transparency by having an annual statement from the labels and the publishers. They can't do it if it's not set out in the English law governed contract. They cannot request the enforcement of the right to a fair and appropriate remuneration because there isn't any under UK law at the moment. Well, there is under Article 18 of the directive. The UK music creators cannot ask for a contract adjustment mechanism to be put in place if they discover that the label and or publisher are making way more money than the remuneration these UK music creators are getting for their music. You cannot have a contract adjustment me mechanism in the UK at the moment. There's no alternative dispute resolution body in place in the UK. If you have a dispute in relation to transparency or in dispute contract adjustment with your label or publisher in the UK, it doesn't exist. There's no revocation rights. For example, if you take Rita Ora, so she is a UK artist, although I think she's originally from Eastern Europe country. Rita Ora has always baffled me because she uh, she's signed to a label, but her music is nowhere. Why? Because she's actually released some tracks, but these tracks have not been used by, as far as I know, by her a label. Her tracks are not being played. She's hardly ever on uh, streamers. Uh, I'd never hear on, on the radio. I think there was a case a few years ago, if my memory is correct, where she said, I want to terminate my contract because my, my label is not putting the music out. It's also sitting on the shelf and nothing is happening. I don't think that she really went very far in, with this with his complaints and this dispute. As far as I know, she's still not really performing much, Rita Ora. And most of the money she made was mainly through fashion and brands endorsement deals. In the UK, because you guys decided not to stay in the EU and therefore not to transpose the directive on the digital single market, there's no revocation right. So too tough for you, Rita Ora. Of course, that right for your UGC platforms also doesn't exist in the UK, YouTube and Dailymotion. They can still benefit from the safe harbor protection and they don't have to go after the rights holders to obtain licenses or strike down the infringing content. To answer your question, Stephen, UK music creators are at massive disadvantage. And so that is what the lobbyists and various bodies representing UK music creators have finally understood, finally the penny dropped, and then they started contacting and lobbying various UK MPs, and this is where this bill has come from, and all this decision to do the investigation about what's happening in the UK and how can we change it. And so what's interesting, actually, with the uh, outcome of this uh, investigation that the House of Commons Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee from the UK Parliament has released is that <laughs> this report they released in, in July uh, contained more or less a, a lot of the provisions which have now become law in the EU through this di Digital Single Market Directive. The committee recommends to classify music streaming as an income source subject to equitable remuneration. So they want streaming to be assimilated to a physical product, like a CD or a DVD. Basically, what they want is that they, the, uh, the committee wants, uh, when they mention equitable remuneration for streaming, they want the record labels and the publishers to divide 50% of the income they receive from streaming with the music creator.
be it former or the songwriter lyricist. This is what they are trying to achieve by referring to equitable remuneration in their recommendations. What they want, this UK Parliament Committee, is that the right to equitable remuneration be coexisting with the making available right. They also want this uh, remuneration to be paid by the uh, rights holders of so the record labels to the performers through their collective management organizations. Why? Because if it's the collecting societies who actually deal with all the streaming income, then it's transparent because they have an obligation to disclose through the, uh, the various statements. So it's clear the CMOs, the collecting societies are in the UK would deal with the uh, equitable remuneration, flashing it 50% for the record label, 50% for the artist. That's clear. So that's that's why the uh, committee is asking for for it to be dealt with through the CMOs of uh, the record labels. Also, what this UK Parliament committee is asking is to launch an investigation through the uh, Competition Authority in the UK into the three major labels because they have understood for all the massive research that they did that the likes of Warner, Universal, and Sony have a 60% market share in the UK, which is obviously a lot. Therefore, they've got so much power over the UK music creators. They want to have this inquiry launched into this oligopoly formed by the majors in the music industry in the UK. They also want to have the same system that the new protection for the UGC, the user-generated content platform implemented in the UK, where the safe harbor would be put on the shelf and instead there would be this mandatory requirement to license the content. There is another point that UK committee has put in, in this is a very good, very good idea. And this is an addition to what the provisions from the Digital Single Market Directive are providing. This UK committee also wants the Advertising Standards Authority of the UK to regulate music playlist curators because they have understood that these playlist curators have an important role in the discovery and consumption of digital music because so many people, they don't have a the time, they just want to listen to music in the background without them having to do the creation. So what do they do? They go to Spotify, they go to playlists and they say, okay, I want to have a playlist with lots of Daft Punk music in it. And then they put press and then they listen to all this music without doing any creation. And so that has a lot of impact on the income of the rights holders on, on the streamers. Because if you are in a playlist, well, that is definitely going to change your fate in terms of making money or not. And being on a playlist for an artist and his or her label and publisher is very important. If you're on a playlist, there's a much higher chance that you make money out of streaming than if you aren't. Power of these music playlist curators is obviously very, very large and very important. And so what the UK committee wants to do is to have the Advertising Standards Authority set up a code of conduct for these um, music playlist curators so that they are transparent in relation to their selection methods for the, the music tracks that they put on their playlist. And also that they disclose if there's been any money paid by someone who owns the track to actually be included in this playlist. This is a bit similar to what is being done with influencers on Instagram or, or Twitter. Now there's a code of conduct that this Advertising Standards Authority has put in place. Instagram influencers or YouTube influencers have an obligation to disclose whether they're getting paid by the, the brand when they advertise some products. I think this is a great idea to, to have a code of conduct for these music playlist curators. And uh, this is one of the suggestions, recommendations made by the UK committee in their report. What is the future of the suggested reforms made by this committee through its report to improve the UK music industry and also to improve the fate of UK music creators? On a factual level, now that this bill has been presented to the UK Parliament and is in its second reading stage in the House of Commons, well, there's going to be some debate, obviously, for these various new music legal reforms to enter into force and to therefore amend various sections of the UK copyright design 
and Patent Act 1988 to introduce this right to an equitable remuneration for performers, as I mentioned before, to have a right to revocation of a transfer of rights after 20 years. From a timeline standpoint, this bill is just going for the motion in U the UK Parliament. Some other facts that we can use to assess the future of this uh, suggested reform is that, as I mentioned before, the UK government, as well as the UK Competition Authority, have replied, have provided a response to the report created by the UK Committee in uh, September 2021. In there, the main message was wait and see. The UK government was like, yeah, that's great. You've done a great job, committee, great reforms, great suggestion of reforms, but let's wait and see. What we're going to do as a UK government is that we are going to ask for more research, put in place some working groups and the music industry contact group, and we're going to uh, launch a research program and alongside stakeholders engagement, and we're going to launch some technical stakeholders working groups, and we're going to sit tight and assess. Uh, <laughs> And in particular, what we're going to see tight for and assess is what's happening in the European Union after the transposition of the Digital Single Market Directive, because we want to see how this works out on the uh, other side of the channel. What I think is going to happen, and this is therefore my humble view on the matter, is that the UK music market is going to, to lose its competitive edge, at least contract-wise, because most business savvy talent will try to sign with record labels and publishers who are based in the European Union, because they will feel way more protected there in the next few months or years. There's definitely going to be a massive discrepancy and the best talent will be signed with labels and uh, publishers based in the European Union, no doubt about this. In terms of, again, assessing the future of the suggested reforms in the UK, I personally think that with the UK Conservative government that we have at the moment, the Conservative leadership, there is no way that the bill presented by this committee and members of parliament in the UK or any new iteration of it will be adopted anytime soon in the UK. This Conservative government will probably view all these recommendations made by the committee and also set out in the bill as too intrusive into the contractual relationship between the music labels and, and publishers uh, with the music creators. I'm not very hopeful that the UK government is actually going to follow through and really is serious about implementing those recommendations made by the UK committee. The uh, US journalists and music commentators who've uh, discussed these uh, uh, reforms and recommendations made by the UK committee have been particularly scathing about it. For example, they said that the committee seems to be aiming to reshape commercial business models for streaming music. These commentators from the US are prompting and lying that UK parliament only makes UK laws. Uh, which implies that the UK cannot single-handedly intervene into the free music majors worldwide contractual arrangement with a talent or go against established licensing agreements set up by streaming services just Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music and Google Play. With his negative feedback coming from the US and with a sort of uncertainty as to what's going to happen in the new digital single market landscape created in the last few months in the European Union, I think that the UK leadership and UK government are just going to do nothing and just wait and buy time so that UK music creators think that there still is a chance that they're going to do something until they realize in a few years down the line that nothing is being done.